Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for having me. I had a choice this weekend to come and speak at Word Camp Boston or Word Camp Brisbane. I chose Boston. Don't ask me why. <laughs> I chose Boston because I was already in the States. I'm in the States most of uh, two months on, then I'm in Australia uh, two months off. I have been told I have a very strong uh, Australian accent. Um, in fact, I did a presentation in Michigan. What is going on with this thing? Stop moving. And uh, at the end, this woman came up to me and said, oh my God, I just loved your presentation. Didn't listen to a word you said, but your accent is fantastic. <laughs> so, um, I would suggest not saying that to me at the end of the presentation. Um, I will, I apologize, I speak very fast. Um, I apologize, feel free to just wave at me and tell me to slow down um, if you can't understand me. But this is being recorded. And you can also follow along with the slides if you go to pz.tt slash wcbos, and that's the Twitter um, handle for WordCamp Boston, so pz.tt slash wcbos. And that will also have links to all the links that I talk about, and um, you can download the PowerPoint, which is accessible. Unfortunately, the um, moving along with the slides is not. Um, still talking to these people about those things, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, so thank you very much for coming. And although this is a WordCamp um, uh, conference, this is definitely something that can be applied to any website that you're building. It's not, uh, there's some Word, WordPress specific things in there um, because we build only WordPress sites, uh, but uh, you can definitely apply this to everybody. So uh, this is my team back in Australia. Uh, and when I started the company in 2011, we started the US company in 2015. I wanted to make sure that I mimicked the percentage of people with disabilities in the general population within my own organisation. So at any one time, I would like at least 20% of our staff to be people with disabilities. And at the moment, 65% of my staff have disabilities. Um, whether that's uh, people who are deaf, people who are vision impaired, people with physical impairments, people with cognitive impairments. So we do actively hire people with disabilities. Uh, we also have this blog called Accessibility Voices, a11yvoices.com, which are blog posts that are written by people with disabilities about their technological accessibility experiences. So if you know of anyone or you yourself would like to contribute, we pay 20 cents a word, which I've heard is quite a lot for like journalist articles. <laughs> and um, please get in contact. So we're focusing on navigational um, uh, app and mobile sites and apps at the moment, but we're also moving into higher education. And I'm speaking, I'm moderating the WordPress in higher education panel this afternoon as well. The one thing to remember about accessibility is it's not just about vision impairments. A lot of people think that making a site accessible means making it accessible to screen reader users, and that's only one part of the groups of people with disabilities that can be assisted by an accessible site. Uh, in terms of our services, if you want to know more, come and speak to me. We do everything that has to do with accessibility. Um, we have three products. Ozplayer, OzArt and OzWiki, and if you want more information on them, there are brochures on the table, uh, the sponsors table, or you can look at our website. Um, but in terms of accessibility, accessibility is about people, uh, the ability for a person with a disability to understand and use a website, application, intranet or program. It's governed in the US by Section 508 and the Department of Justice Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's achieved by following the W3C web content accessibility guidelines. And it's important for a number of different reasons. Firstly, it allows people with disabilities to access information like anybody else. So for example, you know, politics is a really hot topic at the moment. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, if someone who was blind wanted to catch up with the daily news, they'd have to go to a specific library that had a braille newspaper. Whereas now they can follow along tweets and you know, the newspaper um, websites and things like that and see what's going on. It also allows them to interact with others without being categorised as disabled. And this is still a fairly 
big thing. There's still a lot of discrimination against people with disabilities. Uh, has anyone seen the movie Me Before You? Anyone? No. So it's basically a movie about a guy who is incredibly wealthy and uh, successful and becomes quadriplegic. And eventually, because of his quadriplegia, he decides that he's going to kill himself. Now, that's just appalling. Um, not in no other minority group would that be allowed. And certainly within the disability community, there was a lot of um, concern about this movie. No one would say uh, or accept a movie that said, oh my gosh, I'm Jewish, I'm going to kill myself. Or I'm an overweight female, I'm going to kill myself. No one would accept that. But when it comes to people with disabilities, there seems to be this kind of idea that your life is not worth living. And it really is one of the last bastions of discrimination. Uh, so when it comes to social media and things like that, people with disabilities can actually interact with others without actually having to disclose that they have a disability. And that can be a massive thing. Um, it also allows them to undertake activities which they're not otherwise able to do. So someone who, say, is quadriplegic or paraplegic can't necessarily do their own grocery shopping. So they'll have a carer that will uh, ask them what kind of fruits they want. Do they want apples or oranges or bananas? And that's the kind of choices that they will get. Whereas if your online shopping sites were accessible, then these people could actually choose exactly what type of apples they wanted. Did they want Granny Smith or do they want Yellow Delicious or do they want uh, Johnny Smith, etc., etc. So it actually opens up the world to people with disabilities in a way that the internet has for the general public as well, but in a much greater um, way. So when we're talking about people with disabilities, what are we talking about? In the world, there's about six and a little bit over six billion people, and one billion of those people have disabilities. And that's equally distributed across the world. It's not that there are more people with disabilities in third world countries. Really, about 20% of any population has uh, ha people have disabilities. And when we're talking about web accessibility, we're talking about disabilities affecting vision. Disabilities affecting how the mind interprets information, also known as cognitive disabilities. Disabilities affecting movement and disabilities affecting hearing. There's one group that isn't really covered in web accessibility, and that's people with mental health disabilities. But I am of the view, and some other specialists are of the view, that mental health disabilities could actually be assisted by web accessibility as well through, say, trigger warnings and things like that. So. Um, I'm not going to show this to you, but uh, if you want to know what a screen reader does, uh, have a look at this video. Uh, basically, a screen reader is a piece of technology that uh, reads aloud the content on the page. Uh, so it interprets the code, so it's really important to know, you know, make sure your code is uh, correct in order for the screen reader to read, read content aloud for those people who are vision impaired or blind and can't see the screen. This here is um, an example of a woman who has a cognitive disability. Uh, her name is Melissa McCracken and she is an artist. And she said, until I was 15, I thought everyone constantly saw colours. Colours in books, colours in math formulas, colours at concerts. But when I finally asked my brother which colour the letter C was, canary yellow by the way, I realised my mind wasn't quite as normal as I had thought. She has this thing called synesthesia. When she hears things, she actually sees them as well as hearing them. Now, I get synesthesia when I get migraines, um, so, but I don't get, get it quite as cool as this. And she actually paints the songs that she hears. So this is the song Tonight Tonight by Smashing Pumpkins. And her paintings sell for thousands of dollars. Uh, so this is a type of cognitive disability. So please, when you think about cognitive disability, don't think just about intellectual disability. It could include dyslexia or ADHD or migraines or epilepsy doesn't necessarily have to do with IQ. Um, and this guy's deaf, and this is just an indication of how easy sign language is to learn. Um, and he's taught his cat to sign for food. So the cat's not actually saying, put that in my mouth, he's actually signing. And in signing without eye contact initially, you wave a hand or lightly touch the arm and the cat does this. So let's hope this works. Come on, computer. Who else hates computers? <laughs> 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 
Trust me, it's hilarious. The cat signs. So, and now I'm not having a go at anyone. I actually don't know sign language and I have two deaf staff members. Unfortunately, one uh, knows American Sign Language and the other knows Australian Sign Language. So the reason that I keep giving myself as to why I haven't learnt Sign Language is that I don't know which one to learn. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not actually a hard thing to learn. And the one thing to remember about people who are born deaf is that their first language is sign language. And sign language doesn't have the, gr the grammatical constructs that English has. And therefore, when they do learn English, it's like learning a second language, so they can have trouble learning um, English and dealing with reading content specifically. Okay, so I know we will definitely, I promise we'll get to the part about how you actually make WordPress sites accessible, but I want to explain so that you can go to your managers and explain to them why you have to do these things. Because if you're sitting here, you will already care about accessibility. You already know it's something that you have to do. Um, there's heaps of information that you can go off and I'll give you and I'll talk about this afternoon. But you probably, I certainly know in my experience, have managers that you have to convince. So one of the ways that you can do that is by talking about the legal precedents. The very first web accessibility litigation was in Australia um, in 99, a year after I started in the accessibility industry. And uh, Bruce Maguire, who was vision impaired, lodged a complaint about the Sydney Olympics website. Now, IBM had built the website and they claimed that it would have cost them $16 million to make the site accessible. And I was like, hey, I could have done it for a million, but they weren't listening. <laughs> so anyway, judge ruled in Maguire's favour and fined SOCOG, the owner of the website, not IBM, but SOCOG, uh, $20,000, which was twice what they uh, said it would have cost to actually make the site accessible. And that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but that was, you know, 17 years ago, and they had to pay all of Bruce Maguire's legal fees, which were half a million dollars, and of course their own legal fees, which are probably several million dollars. So it was definitely something that put accessibility on the map. Then, you know, things were quiet for a while, and then in 2009, Target got sued by the National Federation for the Blind for not having an accessible website. Now, that didn't end up in court. It got settled before it reached court. Um, and it was settled for $6 million. And their legal fees were at least three and a half million because they had to pay the National Federation for the Blind's legal fees. And they also pay the National Federation for the Blind $250,000 a year to test their website. A few years later, a uh, employee of the Government of Canada uh, complained that the websites were all WCAG 1 compliant, so the first version of these uh, guidelines that I'll talk about in a moment, as opposed to the second version. And uh, the judge ruled in her favour and required that all government websites in Canada were accessible within 15 months. A few years later, uh, the National Association for the Deaf sued Netflix because none of their content was captioned. Netflix uh, saw it through to the bitter end and argued that they couldn't provide captions because it would be a breach of copyright, um, even if those captions were already developed and provided by the TV services. Judge disagreed with them, uh, fined them $795,000 and required that they caption all their content within two years, which they did do. Um, and then we've got the Department of Transport here that requires that all websites are accessible by the end of, well, it was the end of 2015, then it was the end of 2016, and now we're still waiting for things to happen. Kiosks, they've given 20 years, unfortunately, to make accessible. So, you know, if you have a disability and you want to use an airline airport kiosk, well, you're just going to have to wait 20 years. Um, but the other things that are interesting is that what we've found in the litigation in the last couple of years is that the actual mediation and the requirements at the end of the mediation are becoming much more stringent. So previously it was make your website accessible. Now it's make your site accessible, have an accessibility person full time, uh, run training every six months, um, have an external consultant um, assist you. Uh, Harvard and MIT uh, have, are in the middle of a lawsuit uh, with the National Association for the Deaf about the lack of captioning of their online course content. Now, the interesting thing about this particular case is that some of the videos are captioned, but they've, been, they've used the YouTube auto-captioning feature, which is not uh, particularly reliable. 
Uh, we, one of our clients in Australia is the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, and we've so far found three different videos where the Prime Minister has been saying something, and they've auto-captioned it using YouTube, and in the captions we've got the, the Prime Minister swearing. So, you know, that's something that you need to be careful of. So now, so not only is the National Association for the Deaf talking about inaccurate captions, they're also talking about the fact that it's an inaccessible video player. Uh, now we've been talking Accessibility Oz about accessible video players for several years. For two years running, we've been testing the other video players on the market. We have one ourselves. Um, so if you're interested in that, as I said, come and speak to me or grab an Oz player brochure and we'll be releasing those results in the next month. So things are getting moving along. Um, I, the question that no one wants to ask but everyone's thinking is what does a Trump administration mean for web accessibility? In reality, he has put a pause on the Section 508 refresh um, and the Department of Justice letters to, um, to people talking about uh, their accessibility issues. However, in reality, states have often have much more stringent web accessibility rules than federal government. So even if he was to disband the Americans with Disabilities Act tomorrow, which is very unlikely, you'd still have state requirements that you would meet. So in reality, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but it might mean things are a little bit quieter over the next couple of years. So in terms of what you actually do, you follow these things called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And I just want to talk a little bit about Section 508. Section 508 is specifically for people that are federal agencies or selling to federal agencies. So uh, that you will sometimes have people say, I need to be Section 508 compliant. Can you provide me with a VPAT? Uh, in reality, Section 508 was based heavily on the first version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and it's not um, as accessible as it could be. So if you want to, if your goal is to make your content accessible, you really need to ignore Section 508 if you're talking about web um, and just follow the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines and be aware that if you meet WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, you will have an accessible website. Uh, Section 508 um, certainly also has issue, uh, uh, things around accessible printers and um, equipment and stuff like that. That's definitely where you still need to look at 508. So WCAG, developed by the W3C, which is an international vendor neutral organisation, Version 1 was released in 99, version 2 was released in 2008, written by a whole bunch of people, and I, I spent six years with the working group contributing to WCAG 2. So if you want to complain about the guidelines, feel free. <laughs> there are four principles, perceivable, operable and understandable. Uh, each principle has a guideline, each guideline has success criteria, and each success criteria has sufficient advisory and failure techniques. In reality, it can be quite a complex document. Uh, so one of the things that we've done is we've split all the techniques into categories. So all your image techniques, all your table techniques, all your form techniques, and you can access all of that information on our website. Uh, there are three conformance levels. Level A, which is the minimum, double A, the medium, and triple A, which is the maximum. And across the world, double A is seen as the standard. The conformance is for a full web page or a process only. So you can't say our web page is accessible except for the advertising banner. And you also can't say our credit card process is accessible except for page four, because the whole process needs to be accessible. Uh, there are four non-interference clauses where even if you have a section of your website that is not accessible, you must meet those four non-interference clauses. That is, don't have a keyboard trap, don't have flickering content, don't have movement that can't be stopped, and don't have audio that can't be stopped. So if you want to learn more about accessibility, the best thing that I can suggest is go to our website, accessibilityoz.com, and look at the accessibility fact sheets. They were commissioned by the Australian government, and it had, there are 13 fact sheets uh, on images, tables, forms, content, source order, keyboard, etc., etc. Um, and it goes through why you would need to meet those requirements, has a developer checklist with correct and incorrect examples, and the JavaScript um, checklist is specifically 
um, detailed and it has a testing checklist as well. So uh, there's a lot of information there. It's all freely available. You can also grab it and use it in your own organisations as long as it's available under Creative Commons Attribution Licence. If you want more information, we have this thing called OSWIKI, which is a database of accessibility errors, screenshots, code solutions. Um, so these are some of the errors under forms. Don't expect you to read that. And this is the kind of thing that you see in OSWIKI. So this is something that a number of organisations have purchased. You can also buy a user licence, um, things like that. We're working with California Community College Tech Centre at the moment to, relate, to create a higher education version that would be available to all higher education institutions for free. So now we get to the stuff that you guys want to know about. How do you build an accessible web, WordPress site? First thing to remember, most default themes are pretty good for accessibility but third party themes are often terrible. So we actually have built our own theme. It was based very heavily on Bootstrap. If you're interested, we're happy to share that theme with you and you can modify it um, as you like. So in terms of the things that I'm gonna talk about today, skip links, keyboard accessibility, ARIA landmarks, forms, navigation, slideshow, modal dialogues, and video. All in 20 minutes. Skip links. Skip links are a link at the top of the page that allows the user to skip over navigation and go straight to the content. So it's useful for people who say use a screen reader and they don't want to read through the content the whole time. It's also used by people who use magnifiers so that they don't have to try and find where the content begins. There are some rules around skip links. It must be the first focusable link on the page. It should be visible, but it doesn't have to be, but it must be visible on keyboard focus, so if you tab into the site, the first tab should bring the skip link visible, um, and there should be an anchor link to the content. Now WebAIM, which is another great organisation with a lot of information, have found that something like 82% of all skip links are broken, so it is very important to make sure that your skip links are correct. Um, keyboard accessibility, never use positive tab index. If you're using positive tab index, then you haven't coded your page properly. Make sure you also use standard HTML elements. Don't make up a JavaScript widget on click just because you want something to look pretty. Uh, use a standard HTML feature and then use CSS. Where you do have to create new elements, use tab index equals zero so the element is, ends up in the keyboard focus order. And if you need to remove something from the keyboard focus order, use tab index minus one. Now, that's useful if you have, say, a modal dialogue or something where you actually have to track the keyboard. Um, but be aware that as soon as you hit minus, you specify something as minus one, it, it is not keyboard accessible. So you do need to be very careful of using that. ARIA landmarks. Now, one of the ways I can tell uh, someone who's built a website doesn't know all that much about accessibility is if there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ARIA. Uh, the best thing with ARIA you, you need to remember is that HTML is pretty accessible as it is and although ARIA does have some great features, not all assistive technologies actually interpret it properly. So you actually need to make sure the underlying website is accessible and then apply ARIA. You can't rely on ARIA to con uh, convey information. So one of the um, things that you can use is the main element and this represents the main content section of the body of, of the content or the application. And so one of the reasons why you might want to do this is that eventually assistive technologies will be able to say, would you like to skip over everything and just read the main content? And that then skip links will become obsolete. So that's definitely something that would be worth using. You cannot have more than one main in a document. Um, and it can't be a child of article, a side footer, header, or nav. Uh, there's also footer, which I also suggest that you recommend because that's also something that assistive technologies can then decide to skip over. Uh, one of the things that I would strongly not recommend you using is things like role equals presentation. If you specify something as role equals presentation, some assistive technologies will uh, ignore that content completely. So we've seen entire navigational areas uh, specified as role equals presentation and the screen reader will just ignore it. 
Uh, accessible video, there is an article that I wrote on creating accessible video which I'll add to the uh, list of links, but basically there are seven steps. The, well, the article says there's eight steps, but the eighth step is don't be scared. So the first is the accessible video player. So we found that actually video players are much more accessible than they used to be. We released Ozplayer about three and a half years ago uh, because we found that video players were not accessible. Um, they were often keyboard traps uh, or you couldn't turn captions on with a screen reader or you couldn't turn captions on with a keyboard and things like that. So the first thing is an accessible video player. Make sure it's fully keyboard accessible, uh, meets colour contrast requirements that you can change everything with the keyboard, etc. You should never autoplay content. <laughs> the problem with autoplay is the fact that if a video plays automatically, it's going to play over a screen reader's audio. Now, the problem with YouTube is it does that, but not just that, it auto plays to the next video as well. So yes, there is, someone always says, but there's a way to turn that off. It's like, yes, but to turn that off is really, really hard. And so the other thing to remember with accessibility is there might be a way to turn off that crazy feature or figure out how to submit this certain thing. We're actually dealing with a, an organisation at the moment where they got a complaint from a screen reader user that they couldn't submit their shopping cart and purchase something. Um, and we've got a screen reader tester who's incredibly skilled, did the screen reader testing for the Amazon Kindle and for the iTunes store. And uh, he said, oh yes, you can, but you have to press enter twice, then tab backwards and press enter twice again. It's like, well, how no one's going to be able to figure out how to do that on their own unless they really know what they're doing. And most screen reader users are just like, you know, most regular people. They, you know, they don't work in, with computers and websites all day, every day like we do. And so they're not going to think to press enter twice and backwards to have three times and press enter twice again. So, no flashing content. Flashing content can trigger epilepsy. Uh, it can also trigger uh, migraines, so that's a bad thing. Uh, you should also make sure the content in the video is accessible, so that means colour contrast, not using colour alone, that kind of stuff. Then you need to provide transcripts, uh, captions for people who are deaf and hard of hearing, and audio descriptions for people who are blind or vision impaired. Now there's only two video players in the world that actually support audio descriptions. One is Able Player and one is our player called Ozplayer. Forms. These are things you need to worry about with forms. Uh, so basically, I know it looks a bit scary, but when you've got radio buttons and check boxes, make sure you use field sets to group them and then labels for each one of those uh, radio buttons and check boxes. Uh, also use field sets to group fields. There's various ways of doing contextual help. For some reason, these people have chosen all three. Um, there's a little sub uh, subtext. Uh, there's a pop-up. Uh, and then there's a little uh, information icon. All of those are fine, but stick to one. Don't use all three in one form. Make sure that your contextual help is within the label element itself. Make sure if you have a little information icon that you can pop up or pop down, that it's keyboard accessible. Uh, so that means you can't use the title attribute because the title doesn't appear on keyboard focus. Uh, fields and field labels, so use label for an ID. Um, and you need to indicate mandatory fields. Now, you can't use an asterisk to indicate mandatory fields because in most cases, screen readers do not read out grammatical marks like asterisks. So what do you do instead? You can use the word required or you can actually use an image of an asterisk with an alt attribute of mandatory field. Uh, navigation. Uh, so everything needs to be keyboard accessible and operate on focus. Now, there's a number of different ways to make drop downs accessible. One is you tab to it and if you hover over it, it automatically drops down. The other, and this is the way that we do it, is you tab to it and then when you press enter, then it drops down. So either way, just make sure it's consistent. Um, and the other thing is hidden structural labels. So you need to make sure that also things change on keyboard focus. So I'll talk about hidden structural labels. This was some research done by a guy in Australia who found that uh, sub or nested, nested bulleted lists could not be understood by screen readers. 
So for example, we can visually see that um, the sub-items panels meet our team, our clients, etc. are sub-items of the About menu, but that wasn't clear to a screen reader user. So what he recommended is to add hidden structural labels, and that's what you see on the right-hand side. So level one, it says level one about, level two panels, level two meet our team, level two our clients, level two example projects, level two testimonials, level one services. And that way you can explain the hierarchy to the screen reader user. Um, and also indicate the current page. Now you can't use just colour to indicate the current page, so you can see we've got a little icon on the current page. Um, but also that icon when you turn style sheets off changes to the text, you are here. And we used a Glyphicon with a text alternative. So be careful of Glyphicons because they can convey information, but by, um, by default, there's no text alternative, so you have to add one. Uh, modal dialogues. Whenever you have a modal dialogue, you must have a close button and it must be keyboard accessible and it must meet color contrast requirements. You need to trap the keyboard within the modal dialogue. You don't want it to go to the page underneath. It needs to, when you create a, a modal dialogue, it needs to be in the user's position in the DOM. So you can't just create it and put it at the end of the page because then it won't get read. Um, and if you increase text size, it needs to still function. You need to be able to read everything. So you might need to create scroll bars and things like that. Slideshow. Um, have a look at should I use a carousel.com. Um, really, how many developers in here? You're probably mostly developers. And like, my developer is like, do we really have to have a slideshow? And I'm like, yes, we have to have a slideshow just to prove that you can make accessible slideshows. But in reality, slideshows, no one looks at them. You know, they're annoying. Um, most people hate them. They, they are trouble on mobile. So, you know, if you can avoid it, that's great. If you can't, follow our rules. Make sure you can allow the user to stop all movement. Provide visible controls to accessible to the keyboard, mouse and touch. You must provide a control to pause. You can con provide a control to move between the slides. Provide a valid and understandable focus order through the slideshow. So make sure that um, everything makes sense if you read it in a linear fashion. There's valid coding and style sheets and provide meaning alternatives to any images. Now there is an article that I've written on this, so um, you can get more information from that. So also keyboard focus is also important. So the standard appearance of the pause button here is white, a white pause on a gray circular background. And when you tab to it, it's a gray pause on a white square background. So that way the user knows that it has keyboard focus and can enter it. And that happens when you hover over it as well. Um, and also, uh, as I said, with or without arrows, um, these are two different examples of mobile um, slideshows. So there's different ways of doing it and they can both be accessible. Um, the one on the right, you can see there's arrows. They're not that clear, but the pause button is much clearer. And as I said, there's an article about that. And you can also use our slideshow. Uh, it's based on uh, something <laughs> that uh, my, develop my CTO would know, but uh, yeah, so you're welcome to use the code that we've already created. Um, we have some accessible WordPress sites uh, that you can have a look at and look at the code. And as I said, if you're interested in using our theme, because we've worked very hard um, on it uh, in terms of, you know, you can use whatever images and style sheets and stuff that you like, feel free to contact us. Um, and uh, I missed video, uh, that went quickly. I missed something, what did I miss? Um, I think that's it. So, five minutes, excellent. Sorry, I thought I had another slide. Um, so, we have five minutes for questions. And I'm sorry it went really quickly. Usually this is something that, you know, I run a workshop for a day. Um, and as you can imagine, it's a full on day. So, thank you very much and uh, there is, there is this thing called uh, Daredevil. Has everyone heard of Daredevil? It's a TV show by Netflix. It's about a blind superhero. Um, ironically, when they released it, they didn't provide audio descriptions, so therefore it wasn't accessible <laughs> to people who are blind or vision impaired. Um, 
there was a huge furor in the accessibility industry and within three days they had released audio descriptions and their audio descriptions are impeccable. They are absolutely amazing. So if you go to the, I haven't actually added it to that, but after this session I'll add it to that link so you can have a look at it. Absolutely amazing audio description, so I definitely recommend it. Um, and it's really good to see accessibility done very well. So, as I said, you can grab the slides and the links, uh, pz.tt slash wcbos. Any questions? Uh, you need to grab the microphone. If you want to head up to the microphone, that'd be great. So, you mentioned um, why you're doing So the question is, uh, would a span tag for text for a screen reader be accessible? Yeah, that's great. And so we call them hidden structural labels and that's how we do it, as a span with text that has a class that's basically hidden. But you need to make sure that when you hide, we hide it, you hide it using the off-left technique. You don't hide it using display none or visibility hidden. Anything that you hide with display none or visibility hidden will be ignored by a screen reader. I just wanted to clarify on the web page that you gave us at the beginning. You see .tt, because I'm getting a page not found, and I want to make sure I can get the oh. place. Uh, it try pz.tt slash wcbos. Yes, that's what I do. Anyone else get it working? Try it with HTTP. Yes. You did. That's not good. What I will do is I will figure out what's going on and I will tweet it out. Yeah, I'll tweet it out. Hi there, my name is Paul. Um, developer for a loading management plugin that we sell for WordPress. And there's been, I guess, a resale question about accessibility of the product that, you know, since we produce just a small part of the web page. Very little of our actual output content is made in the courses and the quiz form determines. Uh, but I guess the recommendation of the copies to start you know, reviewing the plugin and making it accessible. So you're saying that you're only responsible for a small amount of a website. Is that and how to make that accessible? Was that the question? Right. I mean, you know, again, we have people coming to us and they will buy a house for our product because we do not declare that we are a product in the even though they don't understand that we're, we're maybe 25% of the total web page. Yeah. We don't control the theme, we don't control. But know, that's, that's fine. You can still say that you're 508 compliant or WCAG 2 compliant just for that section. And if you want, feel free to come and talk to me and show me what the section is and I can say, you know, these are the kind of fact sheets that might help you. Because you can still say, you know, obviously if you're sitting it within someone else's theme, then you're not, you know, responsible for that theme. You can definitely make that clear to the client. Same thing about recently released a part of the course where we actually sat through the Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question was, you know, he provides the audio, but you pro provide, sorry, you provide the feature to add the audio, but not the actual audio itself. So, in that way, what you could say to clients is, it's your responsibility, or whoever you get the audio from, it's your responsibility to provide these alternatives, and we've found these, we've provided these way to provide those alternatives. But yeah, please come and talk to me because I'd definitely like to have a look. So, by the way, is that in your Yes, it is. Yes, and that's WCAG. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so you mentioned uh, you can mount HTML and the ability to accessibility in the What if you're using a framework like Angular.js, which relies heavily on custom tag? Yeah. Angular is better than it was a year ago. It's still pretty bad. 
So um, uh, we we just tend to avoid it. Um, However, having said that, we've just hired a developer who's very skilled in it, so we're hoping that he can actually help in that way. Um, really, you just have to do custom coding. I mean, that's really the only, yeah. So, and, and actually, contact, you know, the owners of Angular or whoever runs it. I'm not a, I'm not a developer, by the way. Um, and say, hey, accessibility, it's important. Yep. Sorry? You have this Angular. Oh, Google. OK, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Google, um, Google's not a very hierarchical organisation, so people just put content out, and it doesn't have to go through any process or any testing or anything like that. And so although they do talk a lot about accessibility, you know, they just don't really walk the walk, unfortunately. Um, so. They have improved their YouTube player, but um, in terms of the embedded player, in terms of accessibility, but in terms of Google Maps and things like that. They did some great work making Google Maps keyboard accessible about a year ago, and then um, the woman that had been doing all the work left and it just went out the window. So yeah, there's your problem. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? I think we're done. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I'll be around today and tomorrow if you want to um, ask me any questions or drop me an email and I'll promise that I'll get that URL working and I will tweet out an alternative URL if, that, if I can't get that one working. Thank you.